Hi, welcome to lesson nine. Why do I struggle to follow Jesus? My name is Grace and it's a joy to be back with y'all. And who are you? I'm Todd, still Todd. It's <laughs> great to be here with y'all again another week. Great. We are, um, yeah, in lesson nine. So you've likely been with your groups for 10 weeks now. Our hope and desire is that you're building relational equity. You're nearing the end of the study. And so, yeah, just really excited for the transparency and honesty that will happen in this conversation. But Absolutely. As we're coming into why do I struggle, we always like to have a goals or what, what equals a win. Uh, as leaders, it's always like why is like where are we going? And there's really three things here that I would want us to emphasize. The first is obviously we're going to come into why do we struggle. We have the, the three things, the world, the devil, and the flesh. So it'd be great. A goal would be that your, your group can identify those three and can explain just a little bit about uh, the differences between them. Um, and so that'd be a great goal. But the second goal, I think, is even more important is we all do struggle. And so if we can understand that and, and give ourselves some grace and some compassion for those moments that we fail um, in, our, in our, our desire to honor Jesus in all things, uh, we're so quick to criticize and, and get down on ourselves and forget the grace of God in the middle of that. And so I think that would be another win. And then um, really the, the third thing is that there's hope uh, that, mm -hmm. that our mistakes don't define us. And, um, and, and with that, I'll just hijack really quick because if, if, if you've been tracking with this this entire time, uh, when we started off, we came back and we said, who is God, right? We built from there. Who is he? Who is Jesus? Who am I? Uh, salvation, like how can I have a relationship with him? then how can I know for sure that we're eternally secure? So you just begin to see this beautiful arch that's coming through and we're secure. And then we pivoted from there to three resources uh, that God has provided so that we can follow Jesus really, really well. And that was God's spirit, right? And God's word and God's people. And those are the resources that are given and so that we're able to live differently. And now all of a sudden we run into this thing of, well, I still struggle. What's up with that? And we're going to find ourselves in this weird loop that when we find ourselves struggling, we come back to, I am secure and I have these resources. And around and around we will go our Christian lives forever, uh, coming back to these resources, to the reality that we do struggle, and then coming back to the resources and that we do struggle. And we just begin to grow out of that. And there's real beauty there. So I don't want us to miss that overall thing that's unfolding uh, here in the Essentials Packet in general. So Grace, we've got uh, here on page 75 some opening questions. Right. Right. And if you have a printed copy of the book or you've downloaded the copy, more than likely you will notice a misprint. So from lesson eight, the opening questions were copied over. And so those are actually in error. So the question should be instead, in what areas of your life do you struggle to follow Jesus? And how can believers encourage one another when we become discouraged due to our continued struggle with sin? So in both of those questions, man, knowing your community, gleaning into what we've said many times before is that leaders go first in this. So again, acknowledging that we do all struggle. And so being, um, yeah, willing and transparent in the fact that, man, we all struggle. And, he and here's how I struggle and what that looks like in my life as we answer that questions in what area do you struggle? I laugh and that I really wrote down in all areas of my <laughs> life, right? And not always in the same ways or in the depth, but man, I've struggled probably in every area of my life to follow Jesus well. And so, and we'll continue to until the day he returns. So Absolutely. So it, it, like Ray said, you hopefully have great relational equity within your group and you're able to, to speak freely. It's why we didn't start with this one. That'd be kind of a harsh mm -hmm. way to start. Um, but here could be a really beautiful place for us just to begin to share more and more about our walks and that this struggle is real for all of us. Mm -hmm. Also, I don't want us to miss your 1 Corinthians 10, 13. It's a beautiful and powerful memory verse. We'd really encourage all of the verses to be tucked away in our minds. Uh, this one is really, really helpful because we have a faithful God who always provides a way of escape. Um, and there's there's nothing that we face that he hasn't given us the resources to, mm -hmm. to, to walk faithfully through. And that's really beautiful. And there have been a number of times that this verse has just been so um, impactful in my life, just mm -hmm. seeing him provide victory from like, oh, yeah, I, this doesn't define me. I can move out of here. So I encourage you uh, and your group to really dive in 1 Corinthians 10, Great. 13. And that second question, how can believers encourage one another when we become discouraged due to our continued struggle with sin? Can that be our encouragement there is that it is to be encouragement. Hmm. So as your group responds with struggles, that, man, we want to be people of compassion hmm. and grace and kindness and allowing space for that. And that in and of itself is a way that we're encouraging. But then 
also not dismissing the fact that, I mean, when we speak truth and that when we do, um, mm. uh, yeah, call out sin in areas of our life, that that still is encouragement because mm. we desire to be sharpening one another. We desire that there be movement and progress towards Jesus. So. Absolutely. Absolutely. Because again, not everybody is carrying around like a perfect church experience, a perfect mm. uh, time. Usually we want to hide these things. The enemy wants us to hide these things. And and when we begin to become vulnerable and real with, with people in community, that's awesome. But that's a really huge privilege. And so to walk alongside and encourage as opposed to to condemn is really an awesome, awesome privilege to, to lead groups that way. So excited for that. So turning the page to 76, we're coming into this reality that we have three powerful enemies. And yet it's interesting, three powerful enemies. But we, one of the things we learned about God is that he is the most powerful. There's none who is stronger than him. And so as strong as what these enemies are, none come close to his power. To keep that in mind as we're stepping in here. You're also going to notice that each of the sections, uh, there's a, a paragraph or two, or in this case, three. Uh, really, we would encourage you to read through those even in your group setting, just to make sure that those have been read because they're going to be helpful uh, all the way through explaining you know, who is the devil, um, what is the flesh. Um, interestingly, we don't have one about the world, mm -hmm. which is the very first thing that we're diving into here. Um, coming into the world, it's it's interesting here. We have 1 John chapter 2, 15 through 17 uh, is the verse that we're, we're looking at. A few things I just want to point out. Um, one is this starts off, do not love the world. Uh, the idea here is that it's a command like stop, but it has it carries with it, it's probably this idea of stop the habit. Stop the normal uh, following the patterns of the world. Stop living consistently in step with the world around you. Um, so that's, that's just encouraging because, again, as a, a follower of Jesus, sometimes people think, I'm going to walk perfectly and I'll never struggle. And when they do, they're like, oh, this is horrible. Mm. He's saying, the habit, we're going to grow in maturity. We're going to look more and more like Jesus as we walk longer and longer with him. So that's really a beautiful thing when we start off in the first John chapter 2. Uh, passage. The other thing that I really want to point out here is it says, if anyone struggles. Now, John is writing to believers, and he's writing to encourage them to grow in their fellowship with God. And again, he's not writing about how to achieve salvation. They already have salvation. They are secure. And he says, if anyone. So if anyone is here, like he's saying, it's possible to have this struggle. And so as opposed to shaming ourselves or those around us to know that there's this provision that when we do mess up, uh, that's not necessarily abnormal. It's just not supposed to be our normal habit. So I think that's just really a beautiful thing here. And then one last little little freebie, if you will. If you ask some folks maybe who are newer to God's word, I know the study that we're leading, uh, we have people all over the spectrum with um, their history within the church, within just even the Christian faith, you run right into this. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. I, that can cause some, some angst, I think, for some people thinking, wait a second, if I'm loving the world, does that mean God no longer loves me? Probably what's happening here is this is saying more long, our love for the Father is not being displayed in us, not that God has stopped caring for us, that we have stopped turning around and being mindful of him. It's that idea in Matthew 6, 24, that nobody can serve two masters at the same time. So just wanted to highlight those few things there. It's this habit, this normal routine that that's not supposed to be normal among the believers of looking like the world. If is letting us know that struggle is real for everybody and then that uh, the love of the Father is not in him does not mean that God has removed his love. We covered that a few lessons ago that we are secure, but more so that our love and desire for the Father is not on display in us. Is there anything else here, Grace, you might jump into or well, you started off by saying maybe this is the only section that we don't have a definition for right. us. And so it does ask, I have that first question, what does John mean by the world? Does it simply mean the created earth as referenced in Psalm 24? Or the other time that world is mentioned that means a different thing is in John 3, 16, for God to love the world. And all three of those uses of the words are different. So what? how would you help us define that yeah, world great, in this Great question. This and I think that you, you hit the nail on the head here. Cosmos, the word, word there can be used a lot of different ways. The physical world. Um, and both here in Psalm 24, but also in Acts 17, Sermon uh, at Mars Hill. 
Paul is saying, hey, God created all the world and all the stuff, and he's talking about the physical world. Same one is used in John 3.16, talking about all of humanity. And then other times that it's used, it's talking about the human culture that's influenced by Satan. It's talking about uh, values, priorities, beliefs, longings, reasoning, morals that are absent of of God-centric, that they are all about me-focused. It's all about my comfort, my desire, my timeline, my name being elevated, so that the world, even though there's no paragraph that's there, what's being talked about here is, again, the human culture under the influence of Satan, both morally and spiritually. Um, you read more about that, you need cross-references for that. You could look both at 1 John, a little bit later on here in 519, or you could look in John chapter 12, 31, or John chapter 14, verse 30, talking about the ruler of the world. The world is there. So really that, again, culture that's influenced by Satan that we're saturated in mm -hmm. as long as we're here on this, on this earth. Great. And so then when you're looking at those questions of how does the world influence us towards sin, what strategies and techniques mm. are employed by the enemy to lead us away from God? Man, if we're, if we're acknowledging that the world is this whole culture that is influenced by Satan, by the devil, then it's like the embodiment of everything around us. That's the, that's mm. the technique and strategy there is that it's um, a world full of distractions that are truly vying for our attention, that are active force away from the things of God. A absolutely. And we'll learn more in on the, the devil section yeah. Um, about his strategies. But I would just say, uh, we were talking about this beforehand, that you end up with the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the mm -hmm. boastful pride of life. When you're, when you're thinking about those things, that this idea of the lust of the flesh, it's the desires from within that I just want to do. I want to act. These are natural urges that I have. So, of course, a loving God would want me to act on everything that comes comes out of me. And, and that's just not uh, the case because we are broken people with broken flesh with broken desires. Um, and But that idea of lust of the flesh is just let me act on these internal things, talking about experiences. And then you talk about the lust of the eyes. You're looking at what's out here that I wasn't even aware of that I needed or I wanted. So lust of the eyes. And the, and the pride of life, really this, this desire to be that my accomplishments my positions make me better than everybody else around me, thinking that there's there's life. And so kind of when I'm thinking about how how does the world influence, the, if it's the culture that we're, we're in, the Western culture, especially it's the really kind of the first time that we've moved away from any type of communal, what's good for the community, to all about us individually. And so you used to be able to say, this isn't good for the community as a whole, but right now, the culture that we are in is all about me, myself, and I. And so you have this narrative that we're bombarded with that says the good life, it's all about do what you want to do. You know, you, you need more and more of things. Uh, your title is going to make sure your positional life is going to equal life. But that's just not true. But we're bombarded through entertainment, through social media, um, and just the world around us are all running in a different direction. And so we can easily get caught up in the middle of that. Yeah. So not great news. <laughs> the question is, how does God want his people to relate to the world? And so we're given this for uh, John 17 passage and Romans 12. And so a call towards sanctification, a call towards transforming, mm -hmm. uh, being transformed by Jesus. And so just resisting the world and the things of the world by knowing him and mm -hmm. spending time with him. Um, I, when we had talked about it earlier, you phrased it really beautiful. So like limiting the intake of lies mm -hmm. then that we um, are participating in. So we'll get more to the, what does this look like in day-to-day -day life in the application. Right. Um, so maybe don't get stuck on this time here, but of course, like acknowledging the fact that, man, to resist the world by spending time with him and knowing him um, as the force against Absolutely. It. If I would only add one thing here, and it's, it's I agree with everything you've said. I just would, if you have people who are maybe a little bit newer again to God's word and you're reading John 17, that's Jesus praying for us. Mm. Like that's just an incredible yes. thing, his prayer for us is like I've given you your God's word. I've given that to you as a, as a resource so that you can resist uh, the movement of culture. You can resist the world, and by knowing Him, it's an invitation into that. It's just really a beautiful thing that we're so well known and, and loved. Yeah. yeah. We mentioned earlier, so we're moving into the section now on the devil that we really do like. I um, think these are well-written passages or pa paragraphs here. So spending some time with that. But then asking, what are the strategies Satan can you identify in each of these following passages? So how yeah. would you set up this for us? 
and I would even back up just, just really quick because, again, in our world, right, there's this push that the devil isn't really real. Like, oh, he's mm-hmm. here's this mm-hmm. fictional character and you're foolish to believe in that. Again, that's the, the cultural force to go like he's mm-hmm. not real. But Scripture always talks about Satan, the devil, as a real entity. Mm-hmm. And so you, we just need to understand that culture says one thing, Scripture says another. Again, this is like, who are we going to listen to? So we're coming in here, the strategies, and there's several verses here, right? Genesis chapter 3 is wonderful at looking to see the playbook of the enemy uh, coming in his in his interaction with, with Eve. You see that he comes in right away trying to, to bring about doubt, uh, has God not said? Um, and then he tries to shift the focus from all the other trees that were pleasant to the eyes and good for food. Uh, onto one tree, the forbidden fruit. Like he just wants it. Like, don't look at all the good things that are here. Look at the one thing that it seems like God is denying. And then he goes from doubt to getting you to focus one thing, then to full on deny that, you know, you're not going to die, die. That's not going to happen to you. You're going to be like God. Again, inciting that whole thing, me, myself, and I, it's all about your comfort. And uh, man, in the middle of that was the perfect recipe to bring about uh, the downfall of all all humanity. Would you add or take away anything here? No. Yeah, I think that was, that was great. And so looking at the rest, man, John 8 is a section of he's the father of lies. Mm. So lies are such a huge part of the way that he operates. Um, 2 Corinthians 11 gets back into like his masquerades and, and just mm. seep with deception. Um, and 1 Peter 5, 8 and 9 that he prowls like a lion looking for someone. So he is active and there is an approach to it. Todd, you have done a sermon series that has helped me with the alliteration of how you describe <laughs> how yeah. the working of the devil. Would you talk us through that? Yeah, just I mean, just really quick. Um, I would just think through when, we, when we're when we thinking about the devil or Satan, we know that he is active. We, we just need to know that mm-hmm. that uh, he is active. That's the first Peter 5, 8, and 9. Mm-hmm. That he does have an aim. He, ha- he has an agenda, right? Mm-hmm. That's John 10, 10. He comes in, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. That's what he's desiring to do, to steal, kill, and destroy. Uh, the beauty of knowing God. Um, so we need to know he has an aim. So he's active, he has an aim, and he has an approach. John 8, 44, it's all through lies. He's really good at it. And then he also, to remember that he does have authority. We're told, and again, John chapter 12, verse 31, that he's the ruler of this world that comes back into, he's influencing the cultures here. So Satan as a whole, He's active, he has an aim, he has an approach to lie, and he has the authority to bombard us with that. And the lies that he talks about usually are about our design, um, about our designer, and about what he has declared what is good. So in, in, uh, just a brief moment there coming through, like he is real though. Um, yep, and those are recent things I think that I found helpful too. Yeah, so then the discussion question of how can we um, think, well, can you think of specific examples when it, <laughs> he has used any of these against you in the past and what factors cause you to either experience victory um, or failure through that. And so I think, again, the acknowledgement that yes, absolutely, we can give plenty of examples of where we have been caused, um, yeah, where he's used those against us. And then again, not getting stuck on like what factors cause you either to experience victory or fail um, in your conversation. Don't you could probably spend a lot of time just on on that question alone. And so giving space for people to talk, responding with compassion and grace with that, yeah. um, pointing towards encouragement and hope because we're in a we're in a lesson on struggle and we're talking yeah. to the devil. I don't I don't want us to be discouraged in this. Absolutely. Absolutely. And we've all we've all been there. Mm-hmm. Right. And, and I love the quote at the top of 78 here. And I'll just read it for us that Satan does not care if we turn out to be extremely wicked people or fairly good people so long as we're not involved in loving God and laboring for his kingdom. And, and that's really his aim. He doesn't really care if we look morally horrible or morally good so long as we're not about God's agenda. Mm-hmm. And um, that's kind of helpful because I think sometimes we think we, could, we can be so wrapped up in my mm-hmm. church attendance and my Bible knowledge and I'm so great. And sometimes pride can be can creep in there and we're all about what I know and, but not so much about advancing mm-hmm. God's kingdom. And he's perfectly happy with us just being self-absorbed religiously, um, equally as if we sit there and say, I'm going to run the opposite direction yeah. uh, morally. He doesn't really care just so long as we're not engaged in kingdom work here mm-hmm. and now. Yeah. yeah. So the third, right, we had the world, right. then we had the devil, and now the flesh. Uh, again, a great um, 
paragraph that's here because again, the flesh sometimes can mean just our, our flesh, just the mm -hmm. physical stuff that we are. But here it's the sinful desire to live independently from God. Um, given two, two sections there, Romans 7, 14 through 25 and Galatians chapter 5, 13 through 21. And um, man, what are some things, I know as you, we were talking about this, that stood out to you that you're learning about the flesh from these passages. Yeah, um, exactly. You just find it that it's a desire to live independently God. So what do I learn about flesh from these passages? That it's in opposition to the spirit, mm. that it's self-focused. It's going to look like the world. And so yeah. there's a desire to be contrary to the spirit is the words used in, in Galatians 5. Right. And, and even 5.13, they're like, don't use your freedoms, you know, it's to serve others. The, the yeah. flesh says, no, no, don't serve others, serve me. So you see that right. me focused. Yeah. And then when, when you come in through here, what does a lifestyle surrender to the flesh look like? Mm -hmm. It's pretty self-explanatory going through there in Galatians, the, the, yeah. the fruit of the flesh, if you will. You have the fruit of the spirit right after that, but you have the fruit of the flesh uh, walking through, whether it's sexual morality, impurity, indecent behavior idolatry, worshiping and trying to find life and anything else. Sorcery, which we get our word pharmacy out of that. So it's this the magic potions, uh, but it also probably relates more than to just occult practices, but it might step into the world of drugs as well. But there's a whole bunch of things as you walk down, like what does it look like? Um, and, and it's interesting, we were talking again about this beforehand. So many of these things are celebrated in the, in the culture that we're in. The very things that are said, these are the deeds of the yeah. flesh. When we watch, uh, we take in media of all type, we're like, man, this is actually celebrated. There's so many of these things that you've offended me, I take my revenge on you. Or like th this idea of ever forgiving, letting go, like that's just challenging not to have it be about me, myself, and I. Like curbing impulses is no longer a thing that we yeah. celebrate. It just seems like every the world around us is saying, unleash the flesh uh, in all of its great ways. And so that's, when we come into the application, that's just something to keep in mind. And I'm not, what I'm not saying is you should never, ever, ever, you know, watch a TV show or a movie. I'm, I'm not saying that we just, we can be very mindful when we look around at the things that we are saturated and bombarded with all the right. time, that they seem to highlight the very things that God says, this is not, not yeah. imaging me really well. Yeah. And then what other power dwells in Paul that caused him to desire to obey God? And man, that's the spirit. And so that's back to lesson six, to be reminded and encouraged that you are indwelled with the spirit and that we do have resurrection power to help us live in opposition to the adversary that's at work. So. Absolutely. So we're, 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 as we're getting coming into application, just one thing to keep in mind is if we're struggling, that's usually a sign that we're saved, right? Because before coming to know Jesus, we were just caught up and going the same direction that the world was moving underneath the influence of the devil, right? And all about the flesh. It was all moving one direction and Christ comes in to our lives and changes everything. And now all of a sudden we have his spirit in us giving us these new desires to want to honor him. Well, he looks radically different than the flow of everything else. And so having this struggle, as hard as what that is, there's beauty in that of going like, wow, God, how great you are. Uh, you give me something greater to live for. But when I'm experiencing the struggle as opposed to being so disappointed and angry at yourself um, to really just stop for a moment and thank him for his work that he has done uh, in us. I just don't want us to miss that. Um, so we're coming into application here. What, what as you look at this, Grace, how would you walk us yeah. through this? I started off at the beginning of this by saying that as lesson nine, we're hopefully 10 weeks in with our groups. And so, man, prayer is that there's a lot of transparency and vulnerability and willingness that's here. But knowing your group and knowing are they going to come in having this done and prepared and so you can't have a conversation about it. Or maybe it's the better way to realize that your preparations is to plan for space for them to mm. have space in group time to do this. These are some personal questions. I mean, for us to know our lies, that's question one, and know our circumstances, and then really know accountability and what we how we can make mm. some progress in those areas. And lastly, it asks you to pray. And so those take some time to really be honest with ourselves right. um, and help articulate and call out things of ourself um, with the Spirit's help. And so maybe that does look like truly you give 
eight minutes, which doesn't seem like much time, 10 minutes at the end of lesson, well then that means you're going to have to budget your time accordingly for the rest of the yeah. section that we just walked through. So. Uh, yeah, absolutely. As, as you're walking through that, it's it, best practice would be, hey, we're maybe in a smaller group. We all know each other and we've all come prepared and we can have some open dialogue because mm -hmm. that would be awesome. Uh, the group that you and I lead together, it's a little bit larger group. It's mm -hmm. it's uh, mixed gender. And so there it's just in that situation, like that's probably not the best place for us all to have this open conversation. But maybe the best thing for us is to be so um almost regimented, but to be able to give them 10 minutes at the end to go, hey, work through this here. Because I know me, and I know that if I were to leave that study and saying, hey, when you leave here, go do this, I'll have the intention to, but it's, I probably won't create the space. Um, so I just, we, we would encourage you to look, if that's your group, that they would really benefit from that, be dedicated on the front end to give them eight to 10 minutes whether you're playing some music in the background, just allowing them to, to pray and walk through to, to really know what are the lies that they're most susceptible to, when are they most susceptible to like yield to that. And then to realize, and, and um, the third point here is, man, you might have to take, as you take a step, there's gonna be resistance, again, both internally and externally. You'll see the flesh on display. The example here is used, maybe you um, disconnect from, from social media. And you'd be like, oh yeah, I'll do that. But it comes to delete the app. Like, you're, well, well, listen, there's some good in here and you'll run into this. You'll see the resistance internally. And then let's say that you do take a, a break from it for a couple of weeks. People then start saying, hey, did you see? No, I don't, I don't have that. Well, what's wrong with you? You begin to see pressure from the outside. So uh, just know that, that when you do take that step, there's probably gonna be some resistance. Again, that's not abnormal, that's normal. Um, and it's actually a really good thing. So great. really it's a great, great lesson. We. We hope that as you navigate through that people aren't just so overwhelmed by the the magnitude of the three enemies, but they would see the beauty of there is one who's over it all, who is stronger than all. He's given us a way of escape. It's always there for us, um, and we need to be mindful of it. Most of the time, like Eve, we get so stuck to just looking at the fruit that we forget to look and see the exit any other way around us. And so getting our heads up in those minutes, of, in those moments of temptation, go that way and go ahead and just flee a situation is totally fine. So we're so thankful for the ways you guys lead. We're so thankful for your, your diligence and your faithfulness in preparing each week, um, praying that God would use this lesson to bring about great victory in all areas of, of your group's life. Yeah. Thank you. Bye.